slide I think we're on now. We will go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Looks like we're kind of down a few today. Uh, if you were out there in the halls visiting, I'm sure they'll come wandering in, but that's right. And as they say, when the shepherd's away, the sheep will play. So uh, anyway, if the shepherd's away, the sheep will get eaten by wolves, so we've got to be careful about that. Anyway, as we begin our uh, Bible study for this morning, I want to welcome those who are online. Hopefully we were able to get that taken care of. Bubba's doing three or four different jobs at once today because uh, a few folks are out. Speaking of people being out, uh, as we turn to our prayer requests, prayer needs, we want to continue to be in prayer for James Steppen. Uh, James got stoned the other day. No, he uh, uh, was, was driving, you know, he drives an 18-wheeler, and uh, he got hit with a kidney stone problem when he was in San Marcos and uh, wound up in the emergency room there. And uh, Renita said that uh, as of yesterday, he's still in a lot of pain, nausea, uh, the the stone is not passed. It's it's lodged. It's stuck. So, don't know uh, don't know what they're going to have to do. But be in prayer for James and Renita as they deal with this issue. Continue to pray for uh, the son of Pastor Jose Rash in Belize. Um, we haven't gotten any updates on his condition. His uh, he was uh, his severely mangled his leg in a machinery accident and we don't know any more about that but continue to pray for Jose Rash's son. Pastor Darren will be returning this week from Camp Meeting Revival in upstate New York. They're wrapping that up today I believe. So uh, be in prayer for him as uh, he's been preaching this week. I want to continue to pray for him. Uh, continue to be in prayer for Lee and Beth Hubbard, Scott Thompson, Linda Vargas, uh, Alana Birdwell's grandmother, Arlene Miller. Uh, continue to pray for Crystal and Cook and her baby. Uh, continue to pray for Becky Moore. Becky's going to be starting radiation treatments this week. And uh, so she's uh, sounded a little anxious about that from what she posted on Facebook, but still uh, challenging and uh, uh, embracing it. Uh, we need to be aware of and pray for the rising COVID cases across the nation and locally. Uh, several youth, including several of our own youth, who went to camp week before last came back uh, and developed COVID. And uh, there was quite a few of them. And because of that, because of the rising COVID um, they have had to cancel children's camp, which was supposed to have been this week, just uh, out of an abundance of, well, not an abundance of precaution, just common sense precaution. So uh, it's, it's going up, and uh, we need to, need to certainly be in prayer for those situations. Um, are there any other prayer requests that you have? Elwin? Yes. Mm. Okay, Scott is intubated uh, in the hospital with heart problems and they've had to give him blood transfusions. So that sounds... Yeah, you want to close that door? That voice comes through the doors anyway. We, we can enjoy it now. We will enjoy it later as well. Thank you for that update. Any other uh, prayer requests, concerns, praises? Anything you'd like to share with us? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer then. Father, we do thank you for the privilege of coming before you with our needs, with our concerns, and uh, lifting up our praises to you as well. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your hand upon us, for your guidance and direction and blessing in all aspects of our lives. And as we come to you, we lift up these particular needs. We pray, Father, that you would touch James and... We pray that this kidney stone would be passed, that they wouldn't have to do anything drastic with it, um, that he would be able to get back on his feet, back in his truck, and uh, back in his place of service for you here very quickly. Be with Renita as she waits on him. We continue 
lift up Pastor Rausch's son. We don't know his uh, situation. We don't know what's going on since the initial uh, prayer request. But Father, you do. So we put uh, him and his situation into your hands, into your care. Pray for healing for him. We lift up Pastor Darren as they're wrapping up this camp meeting. We pray, Father, that in their services today, you would be glorified in a mighty and wonderful way. And we pray for your protection upon them and the others as they travel back to their homes and that uh, you would watch over them. We continue to pray for Lee and Beth and their situations and just pray for your touch of healing and strength to be upon them. We lift up Scott before you now as he's in the hospital, intubated, uh, having heart issues. We pray, Father, for your touch once again to be upon him. Lord, he has so many physical needs, medical needs, but we know, Lord, that you can overcome all of these. So we pray for this end, uh, that you would touch him and heal him. We lift up Linda Vargas, and thank you, Lord, that she's continuing to do well. And uh, we do pray for Colby and Desi as they have uh, tested positive for COVID. And just pray, Father, that their situations would not be too serious. We continue to lift up Arlene Miller. We haven't heard a report lately regarding her but we just continue to pray for her spiritual and physical needs that you would touch and strengthen and help. We lift up Crystalline. We just pray, Father, that you would continue to protect her, watch over them as they're on vacation, bring them back safely home to us. We lift up Becky Moore to you, Lord, as she's beginning this uh, second round of uh, treatments, beginning her radiation now that she's done with chemo. And we pray, Lord, that it would go easy for her that, uh, that she wouldn't have the, the sickness and the problems that she had with the chemo, that it would be totally effective above all in killing out this cancer. And Father, we pray for those that are uh, suffering from COVID, the uh, new cases that are on the rise uh, all over our nation. We pray, Father, that uh, you would move in our nation and in our world to Put this virus to an end, Lord, that you would uh, help those that are suffering and protect those that have not received, that have not uh, gotten it yet. Just, just pray for your protection upon them. Help us, Lord, now as we look into this study, this Bible study, and help us to glean from it what you would have for us to know, that we might be more appreciative of the life that we have and of your hand in involved in all of it and we pray this in jesus name for his sake amen well this uh little church interesting structure uh interesting uh architecture on it uh, unfortunately it's abandoned it's an abandoned baptist church in the town of brandon anyone know where brandon is it's east of Hillsboro on Highway 22. So uh, that's kind of, uh, it's between Hillsboro and Frost. Everyone knows where Frost is, right? Well, maybe not. Anyway, uh, I found it an interesting architectural design, uh, rather unusual. Well, today we begin a, uh, a new series, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the subject of a time for everything from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. And for those that are joining us online, I need to apologize right now. And for you who are here in person, I need to give you a plea right now. So much of this is interaction. It's not just lecture. Uh, I, I do want to hear back from you on things. And so... Uh, those of you online, if you don't catch everything that's said, I, I try to uh, fill everyone in. But, but if for some reason you don't catch it, uh, then uh, we will muddle through. Yes, Ken. Mm-hmm. They who laid out the uh, canon of the Bible, who prayed over and studied and chose uh, the 66 books of the Bible, 
felt inspired to put it in there. For that reason, I accept it. <laughs> mm hmm. I, w I would see that it would be in there, it would be chosen to be in there before the Song of Solomon. <laughs> but they chose that one as well. So uh, it's in there, and it does have some good spiritual truths for us. So uh, we... Mm -hmm. It is in the wisdom literature genre. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's general truths that uh, apply in most every situation. Uh, that one verse in Proverbs, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old he will not depart from it. Some of us know that in real life, sometimes that just doesn't happen. And uh, so we have to accept that as a general truth, uh, but not a very specific truth for every, uh, for every situation. So, yeah, that's, that's the way we have to look at it. And I appreciate you bringing up that insight into the nature of the book of Ecclesiastes. We will have a couple of lessons on it. So. All right. So... What is the meaning of life? Here's where you give me your feedback. What is the meaning of life? I know for some of us it's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we diet. Uh, that's when we have uh, potluck lunches at church or dinners. Well, for you, what is the meaning of life? Any thoughts, any ideas? To love God. Praise Him forever. That's, that's a good way to put it. Okay, what is the purpose of life? <laughs> mm -hmm. And that gives meaning to life. Yeah, gives purpose to life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, to help one another find their relationship uh, with God. What are some different philosophies? Now, you don't, you don't have to say that you agree with them. Uh, but what are some different philosophies that you have heard regarding the meaning of life? Different ways people have looked at what is the meaning or the purpose of life. Well, I've got a few of them here. Uh, but, but first, I'm going to ask, what shapes a person's attitude toward life? What are some things that shape a person's attitude toward life? Their upbringing? Their experiences, Carolyn? Okay, their upbringing, their experiences, uh, what has happened to them in life. Anything else? David? David? So a person's views regarding God are at the foundation of their views of life. That's a good way to put it. Yes, absolutely. Um, this is a subject that's been debated for thousands of years. And 
One thing that distinguishes the great philosophers from the one another <clears throat> is the way that they clarified this particular, uh, clarified their particular views of life. Antisthenes was the father of cynicism, the cynics. He said the meaning of life is to be self-sufficient. Don't rely on anyone else. Democritus, he's a freaky looking one. He's the father of hedonism. He maintained that the meaning of life is to indulge yourself in pleasure now. That's the eat, drink, and be merry philosophy of life. It came from, from him. Epicurus taught something similar that the meaning of life was to free yourself from pain. And the Epicurean society deals with, with cooking and uh, um, what you put into your body, things such as that. Erasmus was a later philosopher. This guy was the father of secular humanism. You want to know what, who to blame for secular humanism? This is him, Erasmus. He said that we are to act first of all in self-interest, take care of ourselves first, and then in the betterment of all of mankind. Plato, one of the philosophers whose names we actually recognize, taught that life should be a quest for knowledge. Therefore, the meaning of life is to learn as much as you can day by day for all of your life. But before all of these came the preacher, the writer of Ecclesiastes. And no, we don't know who he was, even though a lot of indicators point to Solomon. But a lot of Bible scholars think that, he, uh, that this was written about 400 B.C. by an anonymous writer in honor of King Solomon. And uh, as Ken was talking about with uh, whether it should or should not be in the canon of the Bible, uh, it throws out a lot of conflicting messages. At first, the writer says life is vain, futile, meaningless, and we're all but a mere grain of sand in the hourglass of time. And so go the days of our lives. Is that the way that soap opera? Yeah. And, uh, but he goes on to talk about the futility of pleasure, possessions, and labor without God. That uh, it's all for nothing without God. He turns around and says that the meaning of life is found in the enjoyment of the blessings that God has provided. So he uh, bounces around with a lot of things. Well, today we begin a new section. It's called Timeless Messages for the Journey. And it's going to get into a lot of uh, things such as this, a lot of questions about what is the purpose of our journey on this earth? How can we better ourselves in this journey on earth? And it's going to be a, a, an interesting study. Yes, Ken. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's as if through the, through the book until the last chapters, he is uh, arguing with himself. He's arguing with himself, uh, taking the devil's advocate side and then uh, switching the other side of the podium and and responding likewise. And if you look at the book in that way, you know, a lot of people have these arguments that uh, he por portrays in, the verse, in chapters 1 and 2. Vanity, vanity, meaninglessness, meaninglessness. There is no meaning in life. And then he turns around to say uh, these things that uh, our life is here to praise God and to give glory with him. Life is found in the enjoyment of the blessings that God has provided. So we're going to be looking at select, select scriptures uh, to help us in our perspective as we journey through this life together. And of course, our scripture for today contains the oldest rock lyrics known to man. And uh, when we hear these familiar verses, you know, we just have to sing, To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season. It's interesting, the, the writer of the lesson says that 
that the song was written by Pete Seeger. No, the song was arranged by Pete Seeger. <laughs> he wrote the music to it, but uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes, except for the turn, 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 and a couple of other things, he's the one that, that wrote it. Anyway, so let's look today at the subject of a time for everything. And we begin with our opening arguments. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. First of all, what statement does this verse make about life? What statement does this verse make about life itself? Life is purposeful. What else? Life is always in flux, in change, yes. What else? Okay, what does this ver what statement does this verse make about God? What statement does this verse make about God? He's in control. Yes. Absolutely. What else? It could very well mean that we are accountable for the activities that we engage in. And of course, I'm repeating that for the people joining us online. <laughs> so, Yes. It, it could imply that we are accountable to the one in the heavens, to God for, for those things, yes. Um, it means that he has put things into place. It also tells me that God has planned things out, that God has orchestrated the events of life. God's plans do not crumble into chaos. His plans are orderly. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity. How might the writer's use of the word time in this verse differ from our common understanding of time? How might the writer's use of time here different for, differ from our understanding of time? Here again, it relates to God. God's time there are appointed times, yes. But we have to understand that God's time is different from our time. And so that's the distinction that we must make and the thing we must understand. We might say, God, it's time for you to do something. And God will say, not according to my calendar. So he has a time for everything. His timing is different. And this passage challenges us uh, <clears throat> all through the study today, to think in terms of God's timing. How could it benefit us to think of life in terms of God's timing instead of ours? What benefit would, be, would there be in thinking of life in terms of God's timing instead of ours? I think above all, we'd be a little bit more patient we would get a better perspective of his will and of his activities in our lives. The second section is a season for everything. And, and look and listen very closely at uh, this list. A season for everything, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate a time for war, and a time for peace. Looking at these verses, has the writer left out anything at all from the passages of life? Is there anything more th than this? Or is this pretty much all inclusive? What do you think? 
I looked at this and I, you know, I can think of little subtitles, but this is pretty much all inclusive of the activities of life. What do these verses say about life? We looked at verse 1, but what do these verses say about life? It's ever-changing, yes, absolutely. As we mentioned in verse 1, it, life is orderly according to God's plan and God's timetable. But life is always changing. Is your life the same as it was five years ago? Is your life the same as it was ten years ago? Is your life the same as it will be in five years? In ten years? In 20 years, we see that life is always changing. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? That life is always changing. How do you look at it? A good thing? Why? Good point there. If we stayed stuck where we are, we wouldn't grow closer to the Lord's. Yes, to the Lord, yes. You know, in a lot of ways, this can be a good thing. A lot of times it can be a bad thing. Change can be better. Or a change can be for the better. Or change can be for the worse. If you've ever worked for government and they've brought in uh, new programs and uh, new ways of doing things, you know well that sometimes change is for the worse. Uh, but nonetheless, we won't. Uh, but sometimes change is neutral. It's just a different direction, neither good nor bad. Is there anything else in these verses that jumps out at you, that challenges you, that surprises you? Anything here that just doesn't seem to quite fit in? A time to hate. Uh, is there ever a time to hate? We could hate our bad habits, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a time for war, December 6, 1941, <laughs> uh, that, that famous speech the next day by the president, uh, yes, there was a time for war. And the, the idea of a time for hate, I, I don't know that there's ever a time for to hate of people, but we should hate evil. Uh, I think of Adolf Hitler. He was the embodiment of evil. We should hate the evil. We should hate injustice. We should hate corruption in our world. It's okay to hate these things because... In hating them, we are driven to correct them. We are driven, driven to seek an answer to them, and that's okay. So, yeah, we have to look at this hyperbolically or whatever, however you use the, the word. Uh, we, we're to look at it in general terms. We have to be careful not to be too specific with a lot of these things. But, on, yeah, I see what you mean. There's nothing spiritual. But yes, but yet, uh, in going through all of these changes of life, should there not be something over-encompassing or o overarching? Well, we're going back, uh, a t season for every activity under the heavens. You, I think you see where I'm going from. So these are the activities under the heavens. 
In other words, being, as someone said, accountable to God. And in God's timing, there is a, a place for all of this. But yeah, and that's one of the criticisms of Ecclesiastes, it, is it does not bring the spiritual home quite as much as it should un until the last couple of chapters. Yes, David. Ooh, good point. How would you say a time to worship and a time not to worship? Yes, good point on it. There's a sense in which every one of these activities is a spiritual activity. And we get into this uh, a little bit more in the next section, the right perspective, verses 9 through 14. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. So he begins with a legitimate question. What do workers gain from their toil? What are the benefits of all the hard work that we put forth? And interestingly, interestingly the writer finds the answer for the benefits of our work in the nature of God. Now a lot of passages in Ecclesiastes in Ecclesiastes sarcastically scream out that life is meaningless. These verses, the preacher says six important things about God. And we look at them through the verses. The first one is, God has laid burdens on humanity. God has laid burdens on humanity. What comes to mind when you see verse 10? What pops into your mind? What other scripture, shall we say, pops into your mind? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. Sickness? What scripture comes to mind? How about Genesis chapter 3? Add, to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken for your dust and to dust you shall return. So it's very possible that the writer of Ecclesiastes is thinking of this very thing when he talks about God has laid burdens on humanity. Because of the curse of Adam, this burden of toil, which is kind of what he's talking about in life itself, has been placed on humanity. But then the second thing that he says is, God has made everything beautiful in his time. I've seen the burden God's laid on the human race, but he has made everything beautiful in its time. Does this seem like a contradiction to verse 10? Does this seem like he's here again playing devil's advocate? Saying two different things? It, it really isn't. I think, I think that he's trying to make a point here. The writer is saying, even though we suffer from the curse of Adam, there are blessings and beauty in this earth. Have you found that to be true? That even though... 
childbirth, passing kidney stones, uh, suffering, uh, sickness, uh, all of these things, emotional conflicts, all of this, even though they're hurtful, have you found beauty and blessing in the earth in spite of these things? And sometimes through them? I think that's the point he's getting at. Country music tri trivia. What song do you remember that comes from the first part of verse 11? Anyone remember? Hmm? Everything is beautiful in its own way. Ray Stevens got that from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And actually last week I heard an, a new song by Willie Nelson and Dolly Parton that's titled Everything is Beautiful. And uh, the, the lyrics were totally different, but the idea was the same, that uh, God has created thing, everything beautiful. The third point that he makes about God is that God's ways are unfathomable. He says, no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. He speaks of God setting eternity in the human heart. God has set eternity in our hearts, yet we cannot fathom what God has done. How do you understand this verse? He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Any idea? David? Yes, there's something more to life. When you look up into the heavens from a mountain in New Mexico, shall we say, or anywhere else where there's no light clutter around. And on a moonless night, and you see the Milky Way, and you see billions and billions of stars, can you fathom the infinite nature of space? Can you understand it? No. God has put the concept of eternity in our heart, yet we cannot wrap our brains around eternity. What's past eternity? More eternity. And so it's difficult to understand it. Uh, what comes to mind when you hear the phrase eternity in the heart? I think David touched on it. We were created for a relationship with God. We find our meaning in Him. Now, we need to understand the concept of eternity, of life after death, was in its primitive stages in the Old Testament. The idea was being fleshed out. God was revealing little by little the concept of eternity, life after death, uh, to the Old Testament writers. There are a lot of references to living on in the afterlife, but the doctrine of eternity in heaven was not very well developed yet. Yet the writer tells us that we have the capacity to envision an open-ended future for us beyond this earth. Think about it. Only humans consider eternity, but we do not understand it. My dog considers only what's in her food bowl the next evening, or that evening. And beyond that, nothing. Isn't it true, though, that even without the resin, even, let me get by, start over again. Isn't it true that even though with the resurrection of Christ, we understand so much more about eternity than the Old Testament writers did, God's ways are still far beyond our understanding. Is that a good thing? That God's ways are far beyond our understanding. If we could understand God, would he be God? I'm afraid not. So, it's a good thing. The fourth thing about God that he says, oops, I didn't flip the uh, slide. God's ways are unfathomable. 
The fourth thing is the ability to enjoy life, even under the burden of sin's curse, is a gift from God. God cursed Adam and Eve, and that curse comes down to mankind. We still live under Adam's curse, but we, as we said earlier, can enjoy life. I know there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift from God. Now, the NIV translates a word here, uh, in verse 12 as to be happy I don't like that word and actually it's not a good word for that a better translation from Hebrews is from the Hebrew language is to rejoice and this points people back to God rejoice uh, be glad this is different from be happy, be happy because happiness depends on happenings it's a fleeting thing Happiness does not always connect with God. But rejoicing always does connect with Him. If we use the better term, rejoice, it points to God as the source of fulfillment. This is the gift of God. The fifth thing that we see is that God's... Yes, Ken. Mm, good point. A gift, not an entitlement. Yes, you've got a good point there, Ken that uh, it is a gift from God, not an entitlement. Something came to me one time, uh, I won't get into the nature of the revelation of what happened, but someone said to me about someone else, he deserves to be happy. No, we don't. <laughs> we don't deserve to be happy. But it is a gift that God gives to us. He allows us to be happy. He enables us to be happy. But you're right, Ken. It is not an entitlement. Yes. And we, he wants us to be happy, but we can only be truly happy in him. So that happiness comes through obedience. And then when we obey, he gives us that gift of happiness. Very good point on that. Fifth point, God's doings endure forever. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Now, the beginning of verse 14 implies that everything will happen as it should. That nothing can be added or taken away from God, from what God does. So does this mean that we are mere puppets in God's playhouse? That our lives are merely an act following a script. As Shakespeare said, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Uh, it's much more than that. He's talking about God's sovereignty and eternal nature. As compared to man's futile toil and brief time on this earth. Everything God does will endure forever. Nothing will be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. And the implication is that everything that God does in our lives will have an enduring, an eternal consequence. But not everything that we do will have a consequence. A question that's often debated, and I use this um, in a funeral for a child protective services caseworker, uh, that I did many years back, 100 years from now. It will not matter what kind of car I drove, what kind of house I lived in, how much money I had, not what my clothes looked like, but the world may be a little better because I was important in the life of a child. I love that uh, statement. The question that's often debated, will anything you do today have an impact on people 100 years from now? 
Well, the answer can be yes or no, depending on the person. But what God does is eternal. And that is meant to bring us satisfaction in our lives. The sixth point is that God is to be feared. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear Him. And now we see the connection of all of these things. The list in verses 2 through 8 of, of everything else to God. These things are all tied to a relationship with God. That everything we do must be as it's done in relationship with God. The satisfaction we find in God's timing, in the beauty of the earth, meaning in our work is all connected to fearing God. And of course we understand that fearing God means to worship Him, to have faith in Him, to recognize a right relationship with Him, and to honor Him as God. He does all of these things that we will look to Him as God. One of our greatest challenges as human beings is responding appropriately rather than reacting in the situations and circumstances in which we find ourselves. How often do we tend to react before we think things through and respond? We get a lot of advice from all sides, some good, some bad. But the writer of Ecclesiastes offers three important reminders to us. Practice contentment. Practice patience. And trust God's timing in every circumstance. That's the crux of the lesson today. Practice contentment. Practice patience. And trust God's timing in every circumstance. Why is it important for us as Christians to practice contentment? Because that enables us to trust Him. To trust in God more. To rely on Him more during the difficult times of our lives. And it's also a testimony to the world around about us. You know, practicing contentment is a testimony to the world not about us so much, but about God. Our faith in God and our willingness to let Him have control. We need to begin to practice trusting in God's timing. Faith in God, I like this quote, includes faith in God's timing. We need to pray for peace and contentment. We need to read the word. We need to give strength to other believers and we need to draw strength from other believers. Contentment doesn't always come easy. Sometimes we have to work at it. And sometimes we have to develop the fine art of being contented, whether we want to or not. On a scale of 1 to 10, how content are you in the circumstances of life? Because to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have all things under control. We thank you that you have things laid out in an orderly fashion. We understand, Lord, that we could rise up against your order in our personal lives, but that it would be disastrous. Help us to find contentment. Help us to find satisfaction. Help us to find purpose in life as we find it in you. And may we echo that contentment. May we reflect that contentment to the world round about us that that might be a testimony to you of your grace in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Worship begins at 1045.